Get ready for success. Leadership Strategies for Women is a show dedicated to providing practical and valuable strategies for emerging women leaders of today. It's your time to get inspired, motivated, and challenged to achieve your vision for success. And now, here's leadership speaker and coach, Ellie Nieves. This is the Leadership Strategies for Women podcast, and I'm your host, Ellie Nieves. I'm the founder and president of Leadership Strategies for Women, where I develop seminars and webinars to help high-achieving women to show up, speak up, and step up in their careers. You can learn more by going to leadershipstrategiesforwomen.com, following the Leadership Strategies for Women page on Facebook and on Twitter. Our guest is Jennifer Jones Austin. Jennifer is CEO of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. She leads poverty fighting policy and advocacy efforts to strengthen and empower disenfranchised and marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. Jennifer is a sought after speaker who appears regularly on television, radio, and at community events, faith gatherings, and professional convenings. She guest hosts the nationally syndicated radio program, Keeping It Real with the Reverend Al Sharpton and the cable program, Brooklyn Savvy. Jennifer was born and raised in New York City. Jennifer, welcome to the Leadership Strategies for Women podcast. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so appreciative of you for inviting me to be a part. Thank you. So Jennifer, I shared all this wonderful stuff about your professional accomplishments. Can you tell us something uh, that we don't already know about you? So, um, if you if you know a little something about me, you may know this, but um, it's not on my resume. Uh, everything that I've done, uh, every um, every every career move, every opportunity, uh, in my opinion, and well, I know what I know what I know. It's been uh, the work of God. Uh, I was called by God to serve when I was, uh, I guess, maybe about 23, 24 years of age. He told me what it was he wanted me to do, and um, I've been doing that ever since. Wonderful. So so what are some of the challenges that you face? Because I know that the Lord doesn't put us out there without uh, letting us, uh, you know, get a little hurt here and there so that we can strengthen up and fight the good fight. Absolutely. Well, you know, the first one is people questioning and challenging um, the sincerity of what you do or um, the authenticity of your spirit in your heart. And so you'll get challenged. I, you know, I found myself through the years being challenged and tested like, oh, she must be uh, a power grabber or, oh, she, you know, she's trying to get to a certain place. I mean, today I hear people constantly say, oh, she must want to run for office. If the Lord hasn't told me to run for office, that's not what I'm doing. And so constantly having to tell people, no, I'm just trying to do the work that I believe that I am called and purposed to do. Uh, and sometimes that not being enough for people. Another challenge that I experience um, is um, men in particular uh, trying to box me in and um, tell me what I can and cannot do. Tell me what my temperament uh, allows for. Uh, tell me what I'm ready for. And very often, interestingly, it's men who've actually uh, positioned, you know, like asked me to take on a, a, a certain position or role that is of a significant stature. And then when I'm in that role, now they want to remind me, well, you know what? I really think you're here. Um, you know, maybe you'll get there, but I have to keep letting you know that you're here. And what I've come to appreciate is that that has a lot to do uh, with me having been raised by a very prominent uh, father, male figure, who poured into me and helped me to appreciate that I was capable of, that I am capable of anything. And so when I encounter men and I come with my whole self and my full self, it's a little bit like, wait a minute, like who told you that you could? Who told you that your voice mattered? Who told you that, you know, that, that it was, you know, that, th that this vision or this goal or this dream was within your uh, capacity and, and you, you could not only aspire to it, but you could achieve it. Who told you that? Because I'm here to tell you, I'm not really so certain. 
just, you know, like you need to stay here. You need to stay down here. Don't think you're up here. Mm. Real and challenges. And, and clearly, clearly you're not a woman to be told that. Mm -mm. And I'll tell you, <laughs> one of the challenges that I've gotten, uh, I've gotten challenged by, um, I'm a black American. Mm -hmm. um, I've been challenged by other black women. Mm. Um, that is probably the most painful challenge. Uh, black women who um, have worked, uh, you know, in the organizations that I've uh, that I've led, who want to challenge my decisions or um, question my, you know, my opinions or my analytics, and 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 have 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 actually deferred to people who also report to me as final decision makers. I've made a decision and then they go and they talk with someone on the leadership team who feels differently. And then they come back and tell me that, well, they're, they're going with the, the person who is junior to me like them and often it's a male. And I realize that that has a lot to do with internalized uh, racism and internalized sexism. Uh, that's been the the the, the most painful challenge. Mm, interesting, you know. And a similar theme. Whenever I speak, the one the, one of the questions that just constantly is being asked is why women pull other women down. Mm. And you know, I call it out. I'm like, well, if women are always pulling women down, then the women who are pulling women down are in this room right now. Hey. So stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, look, with 53% of uh, Caucasian women voted for Donald Trump and not Hillary Clinton, 53% of Caucasian women voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. That tells you how internalized sexism is, right? I'm not even speaking to her value as a candidate. But just that you thought better to keep to put this man, given all he'd said about women and his treatment of women, you determined that it was better to have him there than it was her. And it's often an unconscious bias, right? Mm -hmm. Something that we haven't dealt with and that we're not even aware that we have this bias. Um, uh, this is a woman called Verna Meyer. She's the uh, chief diversity officer for Netflix. and. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of sitting in on one of her presentations and she talked about a personal experience uh, getting on an airplane and then mm -hmm. realizing that the pilot was a woman and mm -hmm. then asking herself, wait a minute, do I feel safe getting on this plane and knowing that there's a woman flying? <laughs> Wow. And she had to check herself, right? But she openly talks about this internal unconscious bias that she had. And that was her mm -hmm. moment to self-reflect and say, hey, why do I have this bias? Let me deal with that and then fight against it. And this is such a, an important conversation for us to have, especially given the, the activities, the events of the day. Absolutely. So many of us are facing these unconscious biases and we're not even aware of them. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially in this moment. I mean, one of the things that this moment being where we're grappling with not only COVID, but we're grappling with, you know, uh, systemic racism and disparities and, you know, and seeing how it's it, you know, people kind of awakening all of a sudden thinking, oh, my God, I didn't know that this has been happening. And so what I'm appreciating is that people are now more clued into um depraved indifference for human life uh, when it comes to, you know, um, what we have seen through the years, uh, you know, from lynching and bringing it forward to the killing of black persons, what looks like and seems to be depraved, uh, you know, like, you know, like indifference when it comes to human beings and the loss of life. But the interesting thing is, I keep thinking to myself, but this is not what racism alone looks, racism alone looks like. Like, do you understand that when you look at me uh, as a black woman and you say to me things like, wow, I didn't know that you were so analytical or, you know, like, wow, like you really did give that some thought. Well, that's my job, right? Like 
you're suggesting something. And when I realize you are saying that to me, but you're not saying it to the, my, you know, my white female colleague, I have to appreciate it's not just because I'm a woman, right? When in uh, several years ago, I worked in an organization as an executive and I worked in a building that had 19 floors. Uh, it was a very big building and there was always a line in the elevator bay. So at one point, the organization for which I worked established an executive elevator. And that executive elevator went to the top floor, went to the second to the top floor. The top floor was occupied by another organization, a law firm. Well, whenever that line in the elevator bank was very long and I had to run upstairs to a meeting, I'd hop on the elevator that was designated for the executives. I had a right to be on it. If there was someone from that law firm who was getting on that elevator, never failed, they would look at me and say, I'm sorry, you, be you belong on the other elevators. You don't belong here. On occasion, I'd get on with a colleague, white male, white female, and nobody would make mention of you not belonging here. And it was as though, OK, well, I guess she's OK because she's with one of them. Okay. So what I'm what I'm getting at is that in this moment, helping people to appreciate that, you know, racism in America is not like just in policing. It is pervasive and and causing people to be reflective and appreciate that they are in some instances, to your point, unconsciously engaging in racist behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, the, the brutal killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Th these are just tragic reminders that we still have a lot of work to do to expose and eradicate mm -hmm. systemic and institutionalized racism in right. America. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So how can we as women leaders make a difference in, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities when it comes to racial equality? Well, I think first and foremost, um, we have to do the work of leaning in and lending our voice, uh, uh, being supportive of those organizations and those institutions that have long been engaged in the practice of addressing systemic barriers related to race and related to gender, right? So we have to get behind the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We need to get behind other organizations. You know, my organization is one where we are working on uh, eradicating, you know, upending, dismantling, poverty, perpetuating policies that, uh, you know, center on race and, and community. We have to do that work of getting behind those institutions. But the other thing that we need to do is, you know, we are, uh, you know, ever increasingly finding our voices. And so we need to do a little bit of what I was just talking about, helping people to appreciate that if you really want to have this conversation about racism, let's talk about what it looks like on an, on, you know, on an everyday basis. Let's help people appreciate it, that it's not simply, it's not, I shouldn't say simply, but it's not just, you know, policing in America. It is, it is presenting in, in so many different forms. When we're still talking about issues of hair in the workplace, right? When I, you know, like when I have a, when I had a boss just a few years ago who, you know, oh, Jennifer's got a whole lot of different hairstyles. Am I commenting on your, commenting on your baldness? You know, but it's like helping people understand you're showing up in a way that is uncomfortable because you're centering on my race and how I show up. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. So I think that's what it is like getting behind and working with these organizations that are doing the work that have been doing the work to look at systemic, uh, you know, structural and institutional racism and, and, and sexism, and then actually being willing to have the conversation. So do you have any resources that you could recommend for women leaders who want to lend their voice to the conversation? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So one of the books that I love most, it's titled The Fierce Conversation. Now I'm gonna tell you as I speak about it is um, that um, it's a book that in some instances has gotten me into trouble. 
Simply the book uh, gives you, it's like gives you tips and tools on how to engage in conversations that are otherwise uncomfortable for people. Uh, you know, like conversations like race, conversations about pay, uh, conversations with, you know, people in your organization about um, how people, like, you know, communications, conflicts or whatever. It's a book that takes you through how to think about to engage in that fierce conversation, not to shy away from it, but how to engage in it. And so that's that's the title of it, The Fierce Conversation. It's a great book. Another conversation. Um, another book, excuse me, that I think is a great one is Tony uh, Tony Morrison's book titled Other. And in this book, she essentially helps to break down how this sense of um, race and identity tied to race is kind of like, you know, like a construct, mythical in nature. Uh, and that, you know, that, that we've worked so hard as people of color to be accepted and to be embraced, uh, you know. Um, but frankly, we should stop trying to work so hard because we're not the ones who created this sense of other. You created it, meaning the you know white dominated uh, populations and, and community. You created it. So why am I trying to help you feel comfortable with my otherness when it's actually something you created? So you need to get comfortable with it. And if you notice the books that I'm talking about aren't, um, how do I best say this? They're not, let's say like, let's just, you know, let, let's, let's talk to race experts. They're like, you know, like tools for everyday engagement. Because at the end of the day, this is what this is about. And I actually firmly believe that uh, if we don't figure out how to start having these conversations, we're going to get nowhere. Mm. nowhere fast yep such a good point such a good point and just coming up just mm -hmm. digging deep so that we do have the courage to mm -hmm. even say i don't know if i'm saying the right thing absolutely and, and can i tell you that um my husband works for a large uh company here in america and as many companies are right now they're trying to they're trying to like dig into this and figure out how to have the conversation. Well, he shared with me that he was talking with other senior leaders in the organization um, about um, how to handle a, uh, a, a video conference event where one person in the organization, as they were talking about race in America and what the company can do about it, one person put into the chat room, I don't really care. I don't come to work for this, right? Like, you know, I'm I'm just here to do my job and earn a paycheck. And I don't really want to like, you know, get caught up in or be bothered by all of this. What happened was like the community just went in on him, right? Similar to uh, what happened concerning uh, the NFL player, Drew Brees, who, you know, came out and, um, you know, like publicly stated uh, that he, you know, he's just a, you know, he just loves the flag and he can't get with anybody who disparages or demeans or devalues the flag. And in some ways referencing what had happened with Colin Kaepernick, but not necessarily speaking directly to it uh, in terms of calling out Colin. And the point I'm making here is that in that instance with Drew, as with this gentleman at this company, you know, people came out and went in on him on them, right? Now that's good, that's okay to be for people to express their feelings and their concerns. But I actually, I think it's important for us to hear the voices of people who are either willfully ignorant or just, you know, naive and uninformed and, you know, disengaged and just unaware, whatever it may be, it's important to let them be heard. Because if they remain silent, then we don't have an opportunity to really educate and inform and ultimately help to transform thinking, right? Or said differently, I mean, you know, my parents are from the South 
And I remember when, uh, you know, we were, I was raised with my siblings here in New York in, in, in the Northeast with them. And I, there were occasions when I remember them saying at the dinner table, you know, at least in the South, you knew where people stood on issues of race. But here, everybody smiles in your face and you don't really know what they think, you know, and, and how they're plotting. And so I think it's important that in this moment where people are speaking out, either in agreement or expressing their frustration and disagreements, we have to create that space for them to be heard because otherwise they're going to remain silent. And frankly, what we're going to have is what we've had over the course of the last three or four years, right? Where we have we have people who speak out every day in racist manner, mm-hmm. but they needed like they were quiet, and we didn't know in 2016 how you know how 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 pervasive this this cancer remains. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing uh, those resources and for sharing about your personal experiences uh, helping black and brown communities. I, I want to pivot to ask you about something personal that you uh, went through in your own life. And a few years ago, you battled leukemia mm-hmm. and you wrote a memoir. Can you tell us about your book? Absolutely. Um, I'm smiling because uh, it's... um. It's titled Considered Pure Joy. And it's about the experience of facing a life-threatening illness or um, anything that turns your world upside down. Uh, Loss of uh, a loved one, loss of an important relationship, loss of your reputation, your career, your job. And as you are, you know, kind of in your darkness, in your wilderness, being able to see and appreciate the the um, the good that that actually you know not only can come from it, but that is actually occurring in the midst of it. And so the book chronicles a better than year long experience with uh, leukemia. Uh, and in short, I'll tell you that um, it takes you from me waking up on a Friday morning with the flu like fever, and by the next Friday. Uh, having believed that it was just a flu-like fever, uh, finding myself the next Friday, um, having just two days before been diagnosed with leukemia and being in a coma, uh, laying in the ICU in a bed of ice with tubes stitched, uh, literally sewn to my neck and my throat, uh, and my husband uh, having been told my uh, that, that I was going to die that weekend, uh, bringing my two young children to see me laying in this coma in a bed of ice um, and um, having to come and say goodbye to their mother. Uh, Only to, you know, because of prayer and doctors who prayed and understood that faith without works is dead, um, decided that they were still going to go to work on me, though they believed that I was going to die in 48 hours. Went to work on me, gave me uh, chemotherapy and the chemotherapy worked only for me to come out of the, uh, the coma and learn that I needed a bone marrow transplant to survive the disease long term. And um, essentially what happened was we went on a nationwide search, uh, racing against time to find me a donor because the doctors believed the cancer would come back and kill me. And it's about uh, as we are, it's about the, the joy that came from um being in this fight for my life, not knowing if I was going to live or die, but seeing how uh, family was just working with me, how community was coming together to find me a bone marrow transplant, seeing how community was actually being healed because of my illness, because there were other persons in need of a transplant and they were being blessed through the efforts that my family was undertaking on my behalf. And, um, and then ultimately coming through and realizing I had to tell this story because God wanted me, God wants me to um, share with others what it's like to be in your darkest uh, days, to be in your deepest valleys 
and to to understand that it is actually working for your good. And you can come on out and actually be better than you were. Consider it pure joy. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I found you to be a source of encouragement. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the end of 2018. And uh, all of 2019, uh, I was undergoing chemo, radi radiation therapy, and other therapies. Uh, so I just finished uh, the treatment and the, at the end of December. Uh, so I'm here, you know, five months out. And, uh, wow. you know, you were a source of encouragement. Uh, just following us. I look at you. I look at you and I'm like, my God, <laughs> you are blessed. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for sharing your story and being open to doing that. Many of us, when we go through challenging times, we don't want to share. We don't mm -hmm. feel like it's the right time to share. We want to go into hiding. And I was tempted to do that for some time when I was first mm -hmm. diagnosed and I had to go through surgery before I started the treatments. I was tempted to not say anything, but I realized that after I started the chemotherapy, there was no way I was going to be able to hide that. My hair was falling mm -hmm. off. I was losing weight. Right. Uh, and I decided to share my story with a lot of people as well. Mm -hmm. And just as you said, the community just rallied around me, both mm -hmm. family and friends. And I used it as an opportunity to just cling to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, that's what happens during these hard times in our lives. We just cling to God. And it gives us a whole new perspective on life mm -hmm. and relationships and a whole new perspective. So even when I see the situations that are going on in the world today, it makes me feel all the more responsible. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Oh, it makes all the sense in the world. You are here for a purpose. Right. Right. Uh, as uh, my father was a preacher and I heard him once say, um, don't you know that God didn't save you for your sake? He saved you for the kingdom's sake. Mm -hmm. And so you are here, you have purpose. And for as long as you have breath in your body, right, you're here to do the work. Um, and, and, and let me just add that what I'm finding in the midst of COVID, um, <clears throat> in the midst of injustice playing out before our very eyes and just kind of the world being on tilt, is that having gone through that life-threatening experience, I got to see how God works. And so what it allows for, it allows me to wake up not fearful, right. not anxious. It allows me to know that he's in control because he took me from a place where I didn't know if there would be a tomorrow. And he's given me many, 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 many more tomorrows. That's right. That's right. I'm so excited for you and for your healing you. and for your, your um, willingness to, to share, you know, it does allow um, for blessings, but it also comes with some sense of vulnerability and you've got to be willing mm -hmm. to put it out there. But in so doing, you're blessing other people. And that's what God intends. That's right. I think so. <laughs> so Jennifer, you've got so much going on in your personal life and in your professional life. How do you balance both your career and what you have going on in your personal life? So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to be honest and tell you that um, I'm privileged, and what I mean by that is that first and foremost, I um, I have a life partner uh, who is just that a partner. Um, like you know, if I wa if I cook the dinner, he's got to wash the dishes, right? If, um, you know, if I dropped the kids off, he was picking them up, right? Like a true life partner. Sometimes maybe too much. Sometimes it felt like he was keeping count in his head and he was like 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. I'm joking. Um, and then I'm privileged because I, um, I have a mother who was always available to help me uh, um, and my husband uh, when it comes to raising our children. So I'm privileged in that respect. But I'm also privileged in ways that um, many aren't in that I tell people my professional is my personal and my personal is my professional. So what that looks like is, you know, the issues of um, addressing poverty and injustice 
are things that I feel deeply and personally, and I get to go to work every day and, 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 and speak to my truth, right? And in turn, I get to work in an organization where um, I don't have to check my thoughts and feelings and emotions about things that are happening in the world at the door because I get to come on in and like, and, and speak to them. So this kind of quality of, I'm not like code switching. I'm not turning off the personal when I walk into the workplace and I don't have to come home and turn off the workplace in my personal space. I have to find time to just kind of breathe and enjoy life. But when I don't have that kind of, who am I and where am I right now? And is, you know, is it okay to be worried about my children while I'm at work? Or is it okay for me to think about whether or not I can go to a baseball game? No, this is important. I'm going. I'm able to live my full life and bring my whole self into my workspace. But then the other thing that I do is I um, I vacation every quarter. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going away, especially during COVID. But um, what it means is I work, 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 work knowing that I'm going to get a break and not just a day off, <clears throat> but I'm going to have respite. I'm going to be able to step back for a week or two weeks and just be. So it, it allows me to go, 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 go. Because I see, I, I see when the break is coming. And the other thing that I do is I try to exercise regularly. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm really getting much better than the, at that telling myself, no, you've got to do this because it's it helps me to release a lot of the toxins in my body, the toxic energy. And so that's something I do. And then I'm always down for dancing. So I'm um, like, you know, like right now in the midst of COVID, uh, I have on my phone an alarm that goes off every three hours beginning at 9 a.m. Uh, until about 9 p.m. at night. Right. And that alarm, when it goes off, nine, twelve, three, six, nine, it has um, uh, like Kirk Franklin songs on it. I think I've got one Donnell Jones song that goes back from that movie, Love Jones in Years Past, Love and Basketball. And um, essentially, I just get up and I dance and it makes me happy. It makes me happy. That's so wonderful. That's Great advice, too. Great advice. So what's next for you, Jennifer? That's always a hard question. Um, it's really a hard question. I shared with you when we first began uh, this great conversation, which has been so good for me. I really it just it's been a blessing for me to be with you. Um, I really feel that God called me to serve and, and to help uh, protect and save his his vulnerable children. And my entire career uh, has been um, structured and aligned, I believe, by God to do that work. And so I don't really plan for the next thing. What I aim to do is to do whatever I'm doing as well as I can to be the best me in the moment, knowing that God is, you know, he's going to provide and he's going to tell me what is next and when it's next. And so that's kind of how I live. Um, you know, I am. Um, uh, I was asked by Reverend Sharpton, oh goodness, I guess now maybe about three or four years ago to um, co-host uh, a, a radio program that he does daily. And then about a year, a year and a half ago, I got a call from uh, the New York uh, WBLS WBL radio station and they said, hey, we'd love for you to come on and be our first female co-host of WBLS Open Line on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. I didn't seek it out. What I did was I did the work. Uh, you know, my father used to say your job in life is to find a field and leave it better than you found it. So, you know, I sowed seeds in the field that the Lord provided and it reaped a, a harvest more bountiful than I, I'd imagined. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. It's, you know, the, the bad thing about it is that people might say, well, I need some real concrete tools. Like do this, do that, do that. All I can tell you is that take the gifts that God has given you. Try to use them as best you can, uh, as fully as you can for the works that he, you believe he's purposed you to, to perform and engage in. And the blessings will flow. Amen. Amen. That's my thing. <laughs> How can our listeners follow you? So a um, few things. One, I, um, I'm on Instagram, Jennifer Jones Austin. I'm on Twitter at Pure Joy or at JJA FPWA. FPWA is the organization I run. But if you want to just kind of see what I'm thinking about life and everyday events, that's uh, uh, at uh, at pure at J, JJA at pure joy. Um, the other uh, place where you can find me is uh, on WBLS uh, on Sunday mornings, and you can either get that uh, on the radio in the tri-state area, or you can go on and find it online at wbls.com. You can hear me on Thursday afternoons on uh, Keeping It Real with Reverend Al Sharpton, again, on the radio or uh, um, online. I also uh, am every uh, first Thursday of the month on the Karen Hunter Show on Sirius XM. And, uh, and then I uh, occasionally guest host on uh, the cable program, Brooklyn Savvy. And then you can also just go to www.fpwa.org and um, there you can find out what's happening, where I may be speaking, uh, what issues I'm working on. Tomorrow on Facebook, uh, I will be uh, having a conversation with Dr. William J. Barber. Uh, many people uh, know him. He is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and um, the uh, uh, the National uh, Moral Revival centered on addressing issues of poverty in America. So tomorrow we're going to have a conversation about the Poor People's Campaign about an event coming up on June 20th. So okay. just, and I'm on Facebook. That's great. You're amazing, Jennifer. I am so honored that you uh, came <laughs> and uh, you know shared your wisdom and talked about your career path and also just engaged in a courageous conversation, right? We need to have more of these conversations so that we as women can understand how we can impact our community. So thank you for your willingness and thank you for doing the work. Thank you for the gift, the blessing of having me and please never hesitate to call on me if I can be of help and of uh, service and support. Okay. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. All right, and just keep taking care of you. I will, thank you. And to close out, as women leaders at work, at home, and in our communities, we play many roles. We're daughters, we're wives, we're mothers, sisters, friends, managers, employees. We are uniquely positioned to influence others and to help shape the narrative. We can each take small steps that will lead to impactful long-term change. And we can start by standing up and speaking out in love. Thank you so much for joining us today. Until next time, God bless.